and somebody asked me the other day, well, how long you been doing, Pastor? I'm going to do it the Lord says, says otherwise. I remember the very moment that the Lord uh, placed this on my heart and therefore on the heart of St. Peter. And so I'm grateful that many, so many, so many have continued to uh, be a part of this line. I, I, I pray and simultaneously believe uh, that as a result of these, these moments together in expectation, uh, that God has blessed us, each of us, in a mighty way. And that God is only prepping us for the greatest, greater things that he's going to do. In other words, we're blessed now, but God's going to continue to bless us in ways that we couldn't imagine uh, it, when his, the season is prepared. And so I'm grateful for all that is going on, and I'm expecting not only the God to do what he has promised, but also expecting us to make good on what God has placed before us. Tonight we're going to continue in the book of John, chapter 3. Um, last night we started, if you just go ahead and turn to the book of John, chapter 3. Last night we started off and we were discussing this conversation that, uh, Nicodemus had with Jesus, and we talked about the fact that Jesus did come and had this conversation with Jesus, with Nicodemus at night. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and had this conversation, and we recognized that, that through that conversation with Jesus, um, there was much revelation. But tonight we're going to see another element of this conversation, that not only that there's revelation, but also that God has, gives, gives a little confrontation, that Jesus gives a little confrontation. I want us to be aware that when we are in conversation or communication or commune with God, uh, that God will reveal things to us. I'm going to be clear. So if you haven't had anything God reveals to you, just continue to talk to him. Uh, continue to seek him in the same way uh, that Nicodemus did, and then you'll find out that God can open doors and give you clarity in ways that you never expected. But don't be surprised if in doing so, God gives you some confrontation. He confronts you with your weakness and confronts you with the challenges that you face and some growth that you must have. Uh, any good parent um, is honest with their children and say, hey, you, know, you, could do, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you could be doing better, you should understand these things. Uh, because of your knowledge base. And that's what uh, happens to us in our relationship with God. Sometimes God says, now, you know better than that. Sometimes, and it is true, I can admit to this. Sometimes I go to God and pray and ask God something. I already knew what his word said, but I was trying to see if I could let Lord, get the Lord to let me slide. I would never forget. And I said one story tonight. I would never forget when I first was called to preach. I tried my best to pray my way out of preaching. I really did. I prayed. Lord, I, I negotiated with the Lord. I, I tried to bargain with the Lord. If you, Lord, if you let me have a few more years, I'll do something else later. Lord, I tell you what, let me just write some sermons down and then hand them out to some preachers. I had come up with all kinds of reasons to not to preach, but God continued to confront me, and finally I was broken, and I thank God for him breaking me. And so do not get upset as you have communion with God in his word and in your prayers and by the power of the Holy Spirit that God confronts you. Um, it's a confrontation all times of the child of God is revelation. And when God confronts us, he reveals to us things about ourselves. So two things we have, God revealed to Nicodemus, about Jesus reveals to Nicodemus about kingdom things, about things of, of heaven. And then he reveals to Nicodemus in our text tonight things about himself. And so we pick up tonight in verse uh, 6. We, we, last night we stopped in verse 5. In verse 5, Jesus answered and said that, uh, a question uh, that Nicodemus had in regards to being born again. Jesus responded and said, Verily, but I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What he, said, what he was saying again was, that there was no physical rebirth. There was a spiritual rebirth. The spiritual rebirth comes by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. That's how spiritual rebirth takes place. It doesn't take place in our physical bodies. We would never, we won't shrink and we won't, we won't go back to our birth size. But what we will do is we will be born in our spirit, which lasts forever. And so, um, that's what the response that Jesus gave in verse 5, verse 6. Jesus further clarified. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit of spirit, again, Jesus gives a straight truth. The flesh is the carnal nature of man. That flesh and, 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 and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He, he gives the dichotomy. He's going to explain this in a second. There's a flesh man and a spirit man. Paul elaborated on chapter 6 and 7, I believe it is, in the book of Romans. But, but, but Jesus wanted to make sure that Nicodemus understood and we understand that the rebirth is about uh, a spiritual rebirth, a spiritual rebirth, and not a fleshly rebirth. So Jesus said, listen, they're, they're, they're not the same. Flesh is flesh, spirit is spirit. Um, in verse 7, um, Jesus goes on to say to Nicodemus, he said, listen, don't be shocked. He says, marvel not. Don't be shocked that I said to thee, you must be born again. Nicodemus, you kind of, you, you should have cast some level of grasp of this, he says. So don't be shocked about it. And then as I explain it, don't, don't tune out, tune in so that you can understand more about what I'm talking about. That, that's an important point that Jesus made because some of us, we, we, we get the introductory level of things in, in our relationship with the Lord. And the Lord is really trying to tell us, no, don't hang on a little bit longer because you're going to get some deeper things if you just continue to be in community. In other words, I 
remember when I first got saved, I thought I knew everything in the club. So to a point in time, I just went there. I could quote scripts. I could preach and teach anywhere I went and didn't understand that God had some more work for me. So God had to slow me down and put me back in my place so that I could continue to grow in him. This is what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. This is don't be surprised at what I'm saying to you now, and don't be surprised at what I'm about to be saying about being born again, because you must be born again. Now, let's look at verse 8. Jesus said, listen here, Nicodemus, I'm going to give you a, a, an analogy so you can understand this better. Thank you. This is the Lord telling us today, too. The wind bloweth where it listed, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and where it goeth. Let me stop there. Jesus said, the wind bloweth wherever it goes. You can hear the wind, but you don't know where it's going. It may be coming from the east. It may be headed to the west, or it could be coming to the east. It might bend around and go north or south. That's what Jesus is saying. You can't, you can't, you can hear it, but you don't know where it's coming. And you know where it's going. And Jesus said this right here. So is everyone that's born the Spirit. The Spirit moves in a way that we cannot qualify, we cannot quantify, we cannot understand, we cannot predict, and we cannot prescribe. And it simply says Jesus wanted Nicodemus and all of us to know that. The movement of the Spirit of God can't be, it can't be controlled, it can't be measured, it can't be, we, we can't keep our hands on it. And so it's something that's beyond us. It is above us, beyond us, more than we can understand. Here's what Jesus is effectively saying. Let the Lord have his way. Let the Spirit of God have his way in you. In your rebirth, let the Lord, let the Spirit of God have his way. Stop, don't try to figure this thing out. Jesus knew that Nicodemus of the Pharisees, the ruler of the Jews, had with all his education, would try to figure it out. Nicodemus don't do it. Some of us, because of our desire, intellectual capacity, our desire to be smarter than somebody else, we want to try to figure it out. Uh, but what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is saying, listen here, the spirit, you can't control it, so just roll with it. Put it like this. If you're in the middle of a lake, or an ocean, let's take an ocean, and, and you're on a sailboat, and your sails are flat because there's no wind, when the wind starts blowing, you don't care where it came from, especially if it's taking you to your destination. And I want you to understand this about the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God blows us to the destination that God has for us. All we have to do is open up our sails of faith, trust God, and let the Spirit direct us to where God wants us to be. And I'm talking about eternity, but I'm also talking about in time. Some of us will wrestle with what we're supposed to do and instead of just saying, God, I tell you what, you, you, you let the Spirit lead me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you. And I know that if I trust you with the, with the sails of faith, that you would take me to where you want me to be. That's what Nic- that's what Jesus was trying to tell Nicodemus. Je- Nicodemus responded with Jesus' comment about the wind and the spirit. Nicodemus has to say to him, how can these things be? Him, Nicodemus said, I don't even understand this, Jesus. What are you talking about? I, you said we got to be reborn, but then you said it ain't a physical rebirth. You said it's a spiritual rebirth. Okay. And now you're talking about the, the wind and the spirit. How, how, explain this to me. I don't understand. How can these things be? How, this does not jive. This is what people say. This is not jive with what I've learned. This is not jive with Jewish custom. This is not jive with Jewish history and culture. This is not lined up with Jesus. I need you to give me some more clarity. Jesus responded immediately and said, listen, uh, Nicodemus, look like to me, your resume says you're a master of Israel. And you don't know this? That was Jesus said. That was a conversation. Jesus said, look like to me. You have spent all this time training and studying, but you would just learn the word. I can hear this in my spirit. You would just learn the words, but you were not subscribing to what God was saying. You heard the words, but you were not getting understanding. Can I tell you all something today? Lord gave me this. Many of us have been in church for a long time, but we have heard, and we've heard the words. We know the scripture, we know the verse, but we have not allowed the Holy Spirit to, to move in us so that the words become impactful to our lives. Jesus just said, rebirth comes by the Spirit and the Word. Sometimes we hear the Word, but if we don't allow the Spirit to have its way in us, all we got is information, but we don't have inspiration, and we don't have the ability to apply what God is saying to our lives. This is what Jesus was telling telling Nicodemus. He said, you a master of Israel. Jesus said to us, y'all go to church. And he's saying, you don't know this? Jesus said, you don't understand this? But Jesus said, let me go. And this is part I love about Jesus. He said this, but he didn't say, you know what? Forget about it. Jesus said, no, let me go ahead and break it down a little further. Here's what Jesus told Nicodemus. Here's what Jesus tells us. Verily, verily. Whenever Jesus said this again, Jesus said, listen to me now, very important. Jesus said, I say to thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. Jesus said, the reason, one of the reasons why you know is because you're familiar with John the Baptist. What John the Baptist preached, he, probably, he preached about the kingdom of God, being prepared for the kingdom of God. Now I've come and I've preached about it some more, but you still missed out. He said, you receive not our witness. We have declared. He said, I declare who I am. I declare I'm sent from God. 
And you still, in the beginning of your conversation, have, have acknowledged me as a teacher, but in a certain sense, reduced me to being a teacher. Jesus says, I'm way beyond that. And Jesus wants us to understand that we cannot box Jesus in. He is a teacher, yes. He is a prophet, yes. But he is the savior of the world. And he is the, he is the center of our relationship with God so that we can experience the fulfilling of the feeling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the center of that. I remember somebody, I think when Rich Small wrote a song, said Jesus is the center of my joy. You don't have joy in your life without Jesus. You might be happy sometimes, but you don't have joy. Jesus is the center of our peace. He's the center of our, our existence spiritually. He's the center of all of these things. And so Jesus is saying, nigga, things you need to understand is you, you haven't understood it yet, but I'm going to keep working with you because right now you have not received fully our witness. Verse 12. He says, I told you earthly things and you didn't believe that. Now, how should you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Jesus said this. I have spoken to you of matters in a context, in a, in a way that you should understand. And you, you, you have got that yet. Now, Jesus says, how, should, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now, here's the difference between Jesus and us. Jesus said this to get, to get John's attention, attention. He didn't say it to dismiss him. He said it to engage him. Jesus says, let me engage you in this right here. You ain't understood what I said yet. And, I, and, I, and I'm about to say some heaven things, so you need to get on your, on your P's and Q's. If, if John, if Nick Zemus was like any of us, when Jesus said this, he said, wait a minute, I, he, I can see him leaning forward in his chair. I can see him reaching out in his spirit to grasp a hold of what Jesus was, was telling him. The next verse, Jesus gets to it. No man, verse 13, no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Jesus says, listen, first of all, John, let me explain more about who I am. Nobody has, will, has, will, has gone to heaven. Nobody will go to heaven except for him that came down from heaven. Who is that, Jesus? Jesus said, that's me. I'm in heaven. I'm, I'm here, but I'm in heaven. I'm, I'm, I'm heaven, but I'm earth. I'm, I'm all of these things at once. I want you to understand that. And Jesus said, let me further clarify verse 14. As Moses lifted up the servant of the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man lift it up. Jesus has declared himself in verse 13 to be the Son of Man. In verse 14, he says he must be lifted up. Let me pause parenthetically to give you a little background. Some of my Thursday night class and others will know this. In the book of Numbers, when the people of Israel uh, were falling basically in their own sin, they were just so caught up in themselves and so caught up in their earthly things and so caught up with all of the, all of the, the people around them. They got caught up, and as a result of being caught up, what they found themselves doing was 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 basically chasing idols, and God says, "I tell you what." Um, he told um, uh, Moses, "Look here, build build this build this uh, um, this serpent, a brass serpent, and lift it up. And everybody that lays eyes on that serpent will live, and everybody who doesn't lay eyes on that serpent will die." In other words, the serpent was the the, the cleaving point. But those who followed Moses' instruction looked upon the serpent; they lived, and those who did would die. Jesus said the same thing is true about him. When Jesus lifted up, all that looked toward him, all that looked for him for deliverance and salvation will live, and all that don't will die. Jesus said this in verse 15, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus said this, what I'm talking about, Nicodemus, is not about this life. It's about eternal life. Jesus said, if he's going to explain his work in just a second, he said this is about eternal life, Nicodemus. I'm talking about spiritual rebirth by the word and by the spirit so that we can have, so that you can have and others can have eternal life. And so Jesus makes it very plain. He says, in order for this to happen, their people are going to have to look to me. Let me pause parenthetically again. Jesus, in no way, shape, form, or fashion, um, uh, has come to just be a blessing to us. He's come to give us eternal life. And there's no other way to eternal life but by him, but by, but through him. And so Jesus says, for anybody to achieve that, they must look upon him the same way that the servant of wisdom lifts up. Jesus must be lifted up so that those who believe in him will not die but have eternal life. Verse 16, and this is, I remember when the, when the full gospel church came out. This is not a joke. I'm just saying, I remember full gospel came out. I remember asking, I remember Christians, what's the full gospel? And he said, well, now it's reached the thing pretty much. It's full gospel. Everything is encompassed regarding the gospel relationship that people have with God through Jesus Christ in John 3.16. Because in John 3.16, what we see, without a doubt, is we see the heart of God, we see the plan of God, and we see the will of God unfolded in 25 words. 25 words in verse 16, we receive revealed to all of us. If somebody says, come to you and says, well, what, is, what is Christianity all about? This right here sums it up. If somebody says, not to say you can't go to some other verses, this right here sums up in 25 words. I remember when I was in school, you'd have to do a paper, 500 words or less to, to explain something. Sometimes it takes me 500 words to half explain. God, by his wonderful power, has explained us the, the full totality of the gospel message in 25 words. Look what he says. For God so loved the world 
that shows us the heart of God. Did God want to save the world because he thought there was some money in the world? No. Did God save the world because he thought he could get some benefit from the world? No. God loved the world, and that's why he saved the world. For God so loved the world. That was his motivation. What was the motivation of God's plan of salvation? Love. Nothing more, nothing less. It was totally his love for us, his people. Period. Point blank. End of story. Out of his love, I love this right here, out of his love, God decided that he would save the world, that he would make available those means for the world to be delivered from the certainty of sin and death. That shows the heart of God. Now, in the next phase, for God told the world that he gave his own to God's son. That was God's plan to save the world. He wanted to save the world because he loved the world, but he said, I'm going to save the world by the one, only one method I can do. God knew that nobody else was, was worthy or capable of taking upon themselves the sin in the world. We've had some great Bible figures. <clears throat> we have Abraham, we have Noah, we have uh, Adam, we have Isaac, we have Jacob, we have Joshua, we have David, we have all these people, but none of them could take upon themselves the sin of the world. Why? First of all, because they had sinned, so they, was, they, was, they, was, they couldn't take upon themselves the world because they had to deal with their own sins. The only person, it wasn't Isaiah, it wasn't Jeremiah, it wasn't Ezekiel, it wasn't Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Micah, name whom Rebecca, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, none of those could take upon themselves the sin of the world. Why? Because they, in their own way, were weak in their flesh. The only somebody who could be responsible to save the world, who had the capability to save the world, was Jesus. And so that was God's plan. I would give my only begotten son, Jesus, to save the world. God said, I did out of love, and my, and my plan is to save the world through Jesus. Let me call, call a time out right quick. So last night I was on the, on the, on the um, Zoom line with the teens, and we were playing Bible trivia. And in playing the Bible trivia, one of the questions that was um, asked was, what's the one sin that you can't be forgiven of? And so a couple of the young ladies were look, 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 look confused by it. So I didn't know you couldn't be forgiven of something. And I said, well, before we go on with the next question, let me explain that. In order to, I said, the only thing you won't be forgiven of is to not receive Jesus as your Savior. Because if you not, don't receive Jesus as your Savior, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So, in other words, if you receive Jesus as your Savior, God is, is, is ready to forgive you and give you salvation. And give you salvation, first of all, and then be forgiven of sins as you move forward in life because you have accepted the gift that he's given us. This is what, um, this is what, how God designed it. His son, period. You accept Jesus, you gotta, that, that, you ready, for, you, you're, you're, you're saved. That's what the Bible says. You confess your mouth that Jesus died for you and that God raised from the dead. And you believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you shall be saved. And so, this is God's plan. His heart, his, his perp, his heart was love. His purpose, or plan rather, was, was, Give his only begotten son. But here's his will. <clears throat> here's what here's what the qualifications are. <clears throat> I love this. What's the qualification of salvation? Is it race? No. Is it is it is it what denomination? No. Is it is it where you're from geographically? No. Is it what language you speak? No. Is it what education you have? No. Is it how much money you have? No. Is it what kind of job you have? No. God said qualifications to receive his heart of love, the qualifications to accept his plan and benefit from his plan is to believe in him. And it says very clearly, whosoever. I want to pause here and just remind us, this is something to celebrate for. If the Lord had put the kind of uh, parameters on salvation that the banks put on loaning money, most of us wouldn't be saved. If, if the Lord had put the parameters on salvation that many of us put on each other, we wouldn't be saved. If the Lord put on us parameters that the government sometimes put on us to vote, we would be saved. But the Lord said, whosoever believeth in him, Jesus, the only begotten son, that person should not perish but have everlasting life. Therein it sums it up all together that, that the, the love of God and God's plan and his will have come together for the purpose of delivering mankind from the certain death of sin. The Bible says the ways of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. What's the gift of God? His His heart of love, His plan of salvation through through His plan of salvation through Jesus, and our acceptance of Jesus Christ. It's, it's God. It's God's gift. It's God's gift. Somebody got to mute your phone right quick now. Let me see here. All right. And so as we look at this, as we look at this text, it gives us some real great joy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close in just a second. I want to hit with one more thing. One more point here. In this, in this last verse, verse 17, we're going to touch on the name. God says, Jesus says this. 
He said, look here, Nicodemus, as you have come to me at night, as you come to me to get some clarity, as you come to me to get understanding, I've shared with you these things. I want you to know this. I want you to share this. And here's what God is telling us. God did not send his son, Jesus, into the world to condemn the world. But Jesus sent, God sent Jesus into the world that the world through him would be saved. God's law was so great that he could have, if it had been us, let's be honest, we would have been looking for who was qualified, who we thought made the cut. But God's love was so great, and God knows everybody, knows everybody's heart. God says, listen, I want the world to be saved. I want not just black, white, rich, poor, young, old. God says, I want the world to be saved, and I'm offering salvation to everybody. And so I'm not coming. I, I could condemn, but I'm not. I want to save. Let me tell you a quick story, and I'm going to get out of the way tonight. I read some years back. Um, it was about a man who had decided he was going to do a, a, a walk around, a, a trip around the world. You know, some of his, some of his trip was on the water, some of it was on land. So that was a particular place uh, in the deserts of, uh, of, of, of Egypt, I think it was, that he was walking. And he walked into a um, some quicksand. It looked like firm ground. And he walked into it and he began to sink. And even as he began to sink, um, various uh, religious leaders came by. Um, um, first of all, um, Muhammad came by. Muhammad came by and says, "Well, um, it's, it's, it's the will of Allah." Confucius came by and told a story. He said, "As evidence, sir, that you did something wrong, and in the future you must avoid this such a such, such situation." Uh, and then later on, Buddha came by and said, "Let your dilemma be a lesson to many." Uh, Krishna came by and said, "Better luck next time." But Jesus came by, reached out his hand. And pull the man from the sinking sand. That's what God has done for us. God sees and saw and sees our need. And, and out of all the religions, and this is why I say Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Out of all the opportunities that people have to follow a divinity, the only divine is God. And his divine plan of salvation was that Jesus would come into this world and die for our sins. And through him, we would receive eternal life. God reached out from heaven with Jesus to pull us and re receive us back to himself, that we may, through Jesus, have eternal life with him. Let us today celebrate this reality. Again, with the uncertainty in the world, we can count on God. And in the uncertainty of the world, we can count on Jesus. In the uncertainty of the world, we can count on the, the movement of the Holy Spirit. In the uncertainty of the world, we can count on God's plan of salvation for us, that he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. I can imagine this brought comfort to Nicodemus, and I wanted to bring comfort to us tonight. As we go to bed, let us just rest assured that God's love is why we're in the position we're in. Let us rest assured that Jesus is sacrificed and God's plan is why we're here today. Let us understand that because of what God has birthed in us through faith in God, through Jesus Christ, let us trust him and let us allow, as Jesus said about the wind, let us open up ourselves to faith. If God loves us enough to save us, surely he'll lead us home. And let us be open in our hearts. Let us be open in our minds to allow the spirit of God to lead us to where God wants us to be. I can guarantee you what God wants us to be is the best place for us to be in this world and surely in the world to come. I'm going to call a time out tonight. I'm going to let us go just a little bit early. I do look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow morning, whether it be on Zoom, Facebook, hearing your voice on the phone, Instagram. I look forward to it. And please be aware that coming soon, I believe we've been working on trying to get all our camera situations right now. Pretty soon we'll be on our website live streaming, and we'll have a crisp, clear picture for all of you all. But I do pray, pray that you join us tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful worship. We've been having great worship. We're going to have a wonderful time in the word of the Lord. I pray that God will open up, um, sit me down, open up some more up tomorrow, that the word of God will go forth to power. Please tune in because there's a word the Lord has given me already this week, and I pray that God will open up tomorrow in a way that causes us to rejoice in where we are right now. I love each of you, and I pray that God will just grant you peace tonight and grant you joy. Let us pray. Uh, Father God, it is now in the wonderful name of Jesus that we come to celebrate your love for us. We celebrate your love, your plan, and your will. And we thank you, Lord, that we are beneficiaries of your love, your plan, and your will, and that we receive Jesus as our Savior. God, if there's someone on this phone who is not in the ark of safety in a relationship with you through Jesus Christ, we pray, God, this word would pierce through those things that would hinder them and allow them to walk out of the darkness of the marvelous light of Christ. We're praying, God, now a special prayer that in this season, that friends and family members of all of those of us who call in on the phone line and call in on Zoom will be saved. If that, that whoever we know that's not saved, they will receive Jesus as Savior during this season. I pray, God, that you would bless households, families, 
And I pray, God, you bless every individual that's on the phone line tonight. Give us not only the ability to understand your word. Give us the, the wisdom to apply your word, but give us the boldness to share your word. I pray, God, tonight you let your word get in our mouths, let it get in our ears, let it get in our feet, let it get in our hearts when we made strong. And then, Lord, let it resound all through us, Lord, that we may be celebratory in all things toward you. Let us declare your word to the dying world that they may know that Jesus is Savior and that God loves the world. If, let it get in our, let us share it with our friends and family in Christ. They may be encouraged and let us encourage ourselves in your word. God, I pray for every, everyone on here tonight. And I pray that you prep our hearts and minds now to receive your word tomorrow morning. And I pray, God, you give to me out even now. Prepare me, Lord, that I may be an instrument tomorrow for your word. And, Lord, it is now and will be in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, St. Peter.